Is Iran trying to develop a nuclear weapon? Is an Israeli attack on Iran coming? Few men have spent more time in the intersection of nuclear weapons and international politics than this man, Hans Blix. As the former head of the International Atomic Energy Agency and then Chief UN Weapons Inspector, Mr. Blix was at the center of events when he publicly contradicted the Bush administration's claims Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. It was an assessment the Americans pushed aside. Iraq has failed to comply with 1441. I feel sorry about the way it did because we failed. I mean, if we had persuaded the Security Council and persuaded the world, then there might not have been a, a war. Today, with open talk about a possible attack on Iran's nuclear installations, Flix is concerned about a repeat. When I listen to Mr. Netanyahu saying that it's not a question of days or weeks, but it's also not a question of years, I think that sounds like a pretty terrible threat. Today on Talk to Al Jazeera, Hans Blix speaks out on the Iranian nuclear program and how to stop what he calls a legally unjustified attack on Iran. Mr. Blix, thank you very much for talking to Al Jazeera. Pleasure. As you know, in November, the IAEA said Iran had been conducting research which can only be useful to a weapons program rather than a civilian one. Do you agree with that? I think you have to look into what they really examined. Um, so the it might IA not be so clear-cut, black and white? No, I think the IEA receives a lot of intelligence from various countries, mostly perhaps from the US and from, from Israel, and they have, it's good that they do that because it may be, they may be led to ask the Iranians or someone else, what are you doing there? We have some tips and we'd like to see it. And go to the right places. But then when it comes to assessing information that are given, then they have to s see whether there's really evidence or it's only information. Do anyway, you think that in this regard, that perhaps they haven't done that job so thoroughly in assessing can this research only be used for military purposes? You uh, must uh, see the material in order to judge that. I, my view is that they must assess it very carefully and critically because otherwise they can be pulled by their nose. We remember from the inspections in Iraq in 2002 and 2003 that there was a famous uh, document uh, alleged to be a contract between Iraq and Niger for the import of yellow cake, that's the uranium oxide, quoted by President Bush in his State of the Union message. The IEA had it for one day and could conclude that it was a forgery, although Mr. El Bardet was so courteous he told said that it was not authentic. Now that shows how careful you ha have to be. And whether they have been that careful before making this statement, I don't know, but they ought to be that careful. But if they are unsure whether it's real, what I would do as a director general would be to the Gord or the governors and say that this has been transmitted to me from some government and let, let you judge it by yourself. But from what you've seen of that research, can it be explained in any other way other than military uh, use? Well, I didn't see the material, so I couldn't judge that. But already from the very early stage, the Iran went for the enrichment of uranium. And Iran has two nuclear power reactors. One of them is in operation. And to build the whole enrichment industry for two power reactors will awake will lead to suspicions in the surrounding world. And this is years ago, and it's continued. They've done more and more. That doesn't necessarily mean that you can conclude that they are making a bomb, or even that they have decided to make a bomb. They may be trying to get in closer and closer. I think there's a difference between the U.S. attitude and the Israeli government's attitude in this regard. The U.S. has concluded that there is not a decision to make a bomb, and the Israelis have, have that view. And I think a great many people would be of the view, yeah, yeah sure, they are, they are moving to make the weapon. So what is your view? Let me ask you in very simple terms. Do you think Iran is trying to make a nuclear weapon? I think they are at any rate getting, trying to get very close to that decision, but not necessarily having taken the decision. And it doesn't matter to me very much where they are. 
I think I'd like to look forward rather than pin the guilt on them that you are doing this and you should be punished. I think it's important to find ways out because ir continued Iranian enrichment of uranium under present circumstances is increasing tension in the region that costs a lot and is very dangerous now. All right, I will want to ask you about the way out, but first I am interested to know how close are they? You said you don't think they are currently trying to make a nuclear bomb, but they're trying to get the means together. How close are they? Well, if you ask the Israelis, they're, well, they're just around the corner all the time. But they've said that for years. So I think we're a bit of a cautious about it. And you can see what the American intelligence says. They think perhaps a year or two years. But this is, these are, are, are estimates that vary quite a lot. The IAEA um, has asked for access to the Parchin military base, as you know, and they didn't get it, did they? And now they had been there. They had been there several times. They didn't get access to everything they wanted to see. Parchin, I understand, is a military site with thousands of buildings. And uh, if any country, I think, would be rather reluctant to let international inspectors to go anywhere in their military sites. So I think, in a way, the Iranians have been more open than many other, most other countries would be. What should the IAEA be focusing on now, then? I think they should focus on the, the fissile material. That's always been the IA job, uh, that without enriched uranium, uh, reached up to, say, 90 percent, or plutonium, you cannot make a bomb. And that's why the whole system of control of the IA is focused on this nuclear material. That's what they're inspecting in Natanz, in Iran, where they enrich uranium, and that's what they focus upon in Fordo, which is the other side. I don't know that they have any, any other sites. They are the places where nuclear fuel is, as in the research reactors and so forth. The IEA should keep track of all this material and make sure that nothing is, is, is diverted away for bomb, bomb making. Are you worried that we are heading towards a war? Absolutely. Is it inevitable now? No, I don't think it's inevitable, but I think when I listen to Mr. Netanyahu saying that it's not a question of days or weeks, but it's also not a question of years, I think that sounds like a pretty terrible threat. What would you say, though, to those who might defend him and say he's only reacting to uh, Iranian statements, uh, well, allegations that Iran wants to wipe Israel off the face of the, the map? Mr. Ahmed I have made statements that are, are aggressive and which I certainly would not condone and I think are unwise on the part of, of, of Iran. But I also understand that the formulation, uh, as you quote him, is not exact that in, that in Farsi it was a little different and perhaps a little less threatening. Nevertheless, it was, not, it was not wise to make it and it has increased the tension. What would be the consequences of a strike on Iran? Well, as you know, it's easy to start a military affair, but it is uh, much more difficult uh, what happens the day after. I think Colin Powell was the one who coined the expression that if you break the pot, you own it. And that was true for uh, Iraq, and that's been true for other situations. So we cannot expect that the uh, Iranian mullahs and ayatollahs will sit and twiddle their thumbs. They will take some action. We don't know exactly what retaliation there will be. But we can fear that it can affect the oil export through the Gulf. Now that could affect the whole the cost of oil, the price of oil in the world. It's not exactly what the world wants at the present. Now we don't want the, the bloodshed. We don't want the destruction. We don't know. We don't want to, uh, it to lead a conflagration in this part of the world. Some might argue, though, it is only the threat of military action by Israel and perhaps the United States that has kept Iran from making that next step. Yeah, that's right. I've seen the argument also that this is really what's, what's, what scares them. When, when the Americans went into Baghdad in 2003, uh, I think Mr. Bolton, the American ambassador to the UN, was quoted as saying, yeah, go to Baghdad and then turn right. Now that, of course, w would have been a threat to Iran. But I don't really find it credible that the Iranian would have believed that the Americans would be ready to go to for, for Iran. I think, th on the other hand, that the, what the Iranians saw was namely was that the Iraqis no longer could be a threat to them, could have been important for them no longer to pursue a military idea if they had such an idea. What would you say now to Iranian officials who themselves are talking about the possibility of a preemptive strike? I think I would say to them that the enrichment program that they have pursued has already caused a lot of tension and that I do not see that they really have a need for an enrichment program. 
It is true that in the 1980s they were denied import of in rich uranium for the for the research reactor. They paid for they bought it, tried to buy it in the U.S., but they didn't get it, and they didn't get the money back. So they can say with some justification that they can do not rely and trust the outside world to deliver, and that this is the background why they start their own. However, I think that when you hear the Russians who are ready to continue to deliver, and the fuel in the Busher plant is Russian, they could get guarantees about the delivery of enriched fuel from Russia, from Japan, from China, and this is not the real problem. I think the real problem is m more a question of pride and dignity. Very frequently, I think the Western world has been unwise in the way they treat Iran. They say that Iran must behave itself as it were a minor they were talking to. And that is, if you want to have an agreement, I think that's a hopeless way. So they must discuss with Iran, as, a, as, a, as an equal, as a grown-up country, an old culture, what, what to do. There would be better chances at any rate. But they would probably argue that it's the Iranian rhetoric that has prompted their response. And I want to come back to something you said earlier there about Ahmadinejad's words, oh. whether he said um, whether he threatened to wipe Israel off the map or whether the original translation wasn't exactly as that. Uh, uh, what, what are you getting at here? Are you getting at the suggestion of perhaps the suggestion that it should have read, the translation of those words should have read that Israel will disappear from the pages of time rather than I will wipe Israel off the face of the map? Is that well, your is conviction a, of what Ahmadinejad is trying to say? He is a populist politician. And uh, we know that they can come with expressions that are not so wise in, in international intercourse. You take Mr. Bush talk about the axis of evil. Well, that was pretty, pretty good in terms of domestic politics in the U.S., but it was not very good in international terms. And Ahmadinejad, too, has come out with something that maybe he felt had, had a good response in, it, in Iranian public opinion. And I would also suspect that he was talking to the Arab street. In any case, it was an unwise wise, uh, expression that he used. What is the alternative to war then, if Iran doesn't stop uranium enrichment? Well, there's short-term alternatives and longer terms. Right now, the positions are extremely rigid, and I don't think you can expect either side to walk back many inches, because they will be accused then in the US of domestic polit politics and in Iran as well. So you don't expect very much. But I think the Iranians could say that we are confirming that we are parties to the non-proliferation treaty. We do not intend to make the weapon. We also are party to a safeguards agreement with the IEA, and that means that we continue to invite the international inspectors to come both to Natanz and to Fordo every, every time they, they want to. And if they can go beyond that and also go on to state that we have been producing enriching uranium to 20% because that's needed for the research reactor and say that we have now produced enough 20% to enrich uranium and therefore we need not do that any longer. We can limit ourselves to enriching to 4%. Well, that would be a pretty good step, I think. On the other side, the Western states and the Russia and China, they could also be less menacing. They could be less threatening and say that, look here, we want a dialogue. It's not that we simply want to Iran to come to the table and, and kneel in front of us. We want to have a discussion, and we have offered them quite a lot of things if they are willing to, to uh, uh, suspend enrichment. And we continue to offer them the, these things, such as supporting Iran to get into the World Trade Organization, supporting Iran's uh, civilian nuclear program, and so forth. If they confirm that, well, that's one step that's better than simply hammering on the threat and on the punishment. I guess the question here is trust, then. Some might say, how can you trust Iran that <coughs> we're going to halt the uranium enrichment or stop it? Because this whole problem came about in the first place because Iran started uranium oh. enrichment without informing the IAEA, didn't it? How do we know you're not hiding no. something in a mountain no. somewhere or some other No, facility? I don't think it is a question of trust. I don't think, uh, I wouldn't expect the, uh, the outside world to trust the Iranians, nor would I necessarily expect the Iranians to trust the outside world. I think they will have to take steps that you can't see. But can you really, the, what I'm saying is, can you really always verify what's going on? Well, Iran not, started a nuclear everything. program without the world knowing. No. Israel no. allegedly has no. the nuclear bomb, no, and true. nobody seems to be sniffing no. around looking well, for that. When I was at the IAEA in the 90s, 
we worked out a new uh, means of uh, inspection, the so-called additional protocol that was adopted in 1997, which gives the inspectors more rights and also gives the countries more obligations to declare wh what they have. And certainly the agency is much better equipped now after inspection to say whether there is something or whether they suspect something. But I don't think you can ever get to saying there is absolutely nothing because proving the negative is almost impossible. So is there any hope then? In your, in your no. very words, proving no. the negative is impossible. How yeah. will we ever create the idea you're floating of well, a region free of weapons of mass destruction? Mostly then? governments have to act on less than full evidence. The inspectors, I think, must be honest. They must say that, yeah, as we did in the case of Iraq, we said we carried out 700 inspections in 500 sites. We have been to lots of sites suggested to us by you, and we haven't found any weapons of mass destruction. But we did not say there is nothing. Now, that's for the government to decide. They will have to judge on the basis of what we say. Do we think there is something or not? But that's not for the inspectors. The governments have to decide on that basis. Should any sort of settlement include an abandonment of weapons of mass destruction by everybody in the region or perhaps even the world? I think so. I think that, I mean, that's the, the more longer term. Today it's too rigid to expect anything like that. But as you know, for a long time there has been proposals for a zone free of weapons of mass destruction. However, the whole of that idea was directed against Israel and Israeli nuclear weapons. Today the Iranian activities in, in enrichment is, of course, the real focus. So I think what one should do today is to say that, yes, we need a zone in which no one has weapons and no one has the capability to do pluton make plutonium or to enrich uranium. That's a difficult operation, but that would give the Israelis a confidence that no one, neither Iran nor anyone else, would come and be able to build nuclear weapons. And it would Is that realistic though? Is that gonna happen? Today today I would say that if I if I I describe this to Israel and to Iran, both will laugh at me and I find that very encouraging. It would be much worse if one of them laughed. It it might be a case, don't you think, of perhaps Iran would not only feel threatened by Israel, but might feel threatened by the United States. I mean, how would you convince Iran to give up its nuclear no. know-how, shall we say, when no. Israel apparently, and the United States certainly, do have the bomb, and from I the Iranian perspective, both are threats. You are looking Iran. for an important point, namely what could actually trigger Iran to go for a nuclear weapon. And I can see that in the 1980s, when they had a terrible war with, with Iraq, but that was a period when they could have a, had a good reason to start getting closer to a weapon. Because Saddam Hussein was certainly looking for one. The Iraqis, the Israelis bombed the Osirak reactor in 1981. And the Iranians must have suspected that Saddam was going in this direction. However, Saddam was defeated in 1991 and then again in 2003. And when you, 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 you drop the idea of a threat from Iraq, I do not see that Iran really has a threat. They're not threatened from Afghanistan or Pakistan or Turkey. And the US, as you mentioned, yes, they've had aircraft carriers in the Gulf. But the Iranians know also that they will not be attacked by the US, uh, except in the context of a, a suspicion of nuclear weapons. So, I, and they also know that Israel will not attack them. It's only in the context of nuclear weapons that there's a risk. So I don't think the Iranians really have any, anything that pushes them towards nuclear weapons. It seems now that whether we have peace or war over Iran's nuclear program seems to be dependent on intelligence, particularly U.S. intelligence interpretation of Iranian intentions. That seems to be the point that they are trying to sort out. What does Iran mean to do with this program? In your experience, how reliable or accurate are those intelligence assessments of political terrible. attention? <laughs> terrible. <laughs> it was terrible. So I that mean, must be frightening. In the Bush administration, as you remember, they, they used to say that we are so powerful that we create our own reality. Well, they did. But, but if you do not have the right diagnosis of a situation, how can you have the right therapy? But there's another element that you do not mention, which I think is highly significant. And that is, is it justified in legal terms, in the terms of the UN's uh, charter, to go for war against Iran? Now, the UN charter would allow an attack on Iran on two different grounds. One, if it were a response to an armed attack by Iran. 
Well, no one can say that, regardless of what Ahmadinejad said, that they have committed an armed attack. So I don't think that could be adduced. The second ground for attacking Iran would be an authorization by the Security Council of the Under Iran. Chapter 7. Under Chapter 7. Now, the Security Council, that would not be in a majority for, a, for an, a resolution authorizing war. And if they went to the General Assembly and, and asked, can we be authorized to attack Iran because of their, we think what they're planning to do? No, there would be a crushing majority against any such resolution. So I, can, I think that any attack that today were launched on Iran would be a violation of the UN Charter. What do you make of the deliberate, apparent deliberate killing and assassination of Iranian scientists? I think it's terrible, and I was glad that Hillary Clinton came out with a condemnation of it, because it blurs the border between civilians and combatants. And it's not the first time that happened. This hit the press, but it's happened before. It's happened for, to people who work for the Iraqi nuclear program in the past, long time ago. And, and I think it's terrible. I think it is counterproductive for those who, commit, who actually do it. Do you ever get a sense of deja vu? We've been here before. When you look at what's going on uh, over Iran's nuclear program, and you remember your mission in inspecting Iraq's no. alleged weapons no. of mass destruction still haven't been found. In some respects, yes. In the respect that in Iraq there was a question of attacking uh, weapons of mass destruction that did not exist. Now here we are talking about an attack of intentions that may exist or not exist. So this is there are some similarity and a bit of unreality about it. But there are also big differences. In Iraq in 2003 was a country that had no, posed no military threat at all. And the U.S. must have known that. Iran, by contrast, today is a country that has big military power. And it also has a, a, a nuclear sector that is very considerable. Whereas in Iraq, there was no, hardly anything left on the nuclear. I'm interested in your statement that the U.S. must have known that. Do you think, you've said, of course, before that the U.S. and the U.K. dramatized the threat no. of Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. But do you believe that while the U.S. and U.K. were dramatizing this threat, in reality, they knew that there was there was no weapons of mass destruction threat. They knew that Iraq was not a military threat. I think they suspected strongly that there were chemical weapons because when the soldiers were sent into Iraq, they were also given equipment to protect themselves against chemical weapons. So I, I, in that respect, I think they, they did not Mm -hmm. So they, they weren't lying to the, to the world in presenting a threat well, by... Well, yes, yeah, so on the question of nuclear weapons, I, I think it, it would have required very little critical examination to realize there was nothing in nuclear. And in fact, within the U.S. intelligence uh, community, there were a number of very reputable and knowledgeable people who, who, who did not believe in it. So, that, so they were lying to the world about the threat of an Iraqi nuclear program, but they had real worries that chemical weapons might be what I have threat. Is that what you're saying? What I said is that they, they first misled themselves and then they misled the world. But you can't mislead yourself if you really know that Iraq doesn't have nuclear weapons or even a well, nuclear program, they, right? They then, you're, then you're lying. There's a big difference between... There can be shades <laughs> between the self-delusion <laughs> and the knowledge. You were head of um, the UN Inspection Commission, which was, uh, as I mentioned, looking for weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Looking back on that whole mission now, do you have any regrets about the way it went, the way you handled things? Well, I feel sorry about the way it did because we failed. I mean, if we had persuaded the Security Council and persuaded the world, then there might not have been a, a war. Uh, what the effect we had, I think, was to convince sufficiently many members of the Security Council that there is not a clear-cut evidence for weapons. And therefore, there was not a majority in the Security Council for an, an attack. If we had said that, yes, we listened to what Colin Powell said in the Security Council, and of course, we have no reason to doubt the intelligence. We are sorry, we didn't find that. We have no reason to doubt it. Maybe they would have got a decision in the Security Council authorizing an attack. At any rate, what we said honestly, and our vision was to be independent and honest international civil servants, I think had a great impact in the Security Council and in the, in the UN, but did not have an impact in Washington. Do you have any regrets about that, the fact they didn't have yeah. an impact in 
maybe at least Congress. Yeah, no, I, 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 feel, I feel somewhat indignant about that. Even now, after the war, the discussions in the U.S. is not that the, I, the IA and then in Unmovic in New York, that we had told them the, in, the, the discussion is still that they're about their own intelligence. And, and I think somehow they regard the UN and inspections as so insignificant that they did not care about it. But they knew about it. I mean, Mohamed El Bardet said in the Security Council that this document you rely upon is not authentic. Well, they, they ignore that. And you Even think the media ignored it. Do you think they're still ignoring the IAEA and what is? Well, if they cannot. When it comes can, to Iran. If they can or not paying as much attention as they should do. If they can use it in their own advantage, then they will, then they will cite them, but not otherwise. Not when it goes against. No, not, not very much. Who, who is responsible for that in the US? Who is picking and choosing when to pay attention to the IAEA reports? Well, I'm not an expert on the inner working of the what State you see, Department who, who do you of blame? Pentagon. But uh, no, there are many people there, of course. And the Pentagon is part of it, and the National Security Council is another, and, and State Department is another. They have lots of capable people. But they also they ought to have some critical sense. They ought to examine data with a critical sense. Mr. Hans Blix, it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you. Thanks so much for talking to Al Jazeera. Welcome. Pleasure. Thank you very much.